start recording this. Yep, just like I just said, it, we're, this is being recorded for future prosperity's sake. And later on, we will put this on our Bishop Hill Heritage Association YouTube channel so that uh, people who weren't able to make it today um, can watch it later on. So uh, today's pro, and also, you know, we're still figuring out Zoom. So we do apologize ahead of time if there's a little minor issues going on. I know with the last program with Dr. Wagner, um, you know, we had a little problem with his PowerPoint, <laughs> getting that started. So we do apologize if there are some minor issues. And uh, hopefully the way things are progressing, it was just announced here in Illinois that we're going to phase five on Friday, which means uh, no capacity or limitations or restrictions. So our next program about Bishop Hill County history will be in person. Uh, will be June 19th in the Dairy Building with uh, Lily Saradell talking about the women of the Bishop Hill County. And then uh, from their point on, hopefully we'll continue being in person for the rest of the year. So today's program is being graciously done by Dr. Caroline Anderson. Uh, she did, back in uh, 1980, uh, did a huge study of material culture here of the Bishop Hill Colony. Spent a lot of time here in Bishop Hill, a lot of time in Sweden. Uh, her work I use a lot <laughs> when it comes to uh, exhibitions and answering questions of various people. Um, so it's great having her today to talk about the material culture of the Bishop Hill Colony. And without further ado, uh, oh, I almost forgot, uh, she is doing a PowerPoint. And then there will be as part of her presentation and there will be time for questions afterwards. And I'll be monitoring the uh, chat room and you can either use the chat room to do questions or at the end of the presentation, um, you can ask Dr. Anderson directly. I will ask you, you know, to, uh, this last time I put her on phones off. If uh, you keep your microphones mute, which I will do after I get done with the introduction. So we won't interrupt Dr. Anderson during her presentation. So now without further ado, Dr. Anderson. <laughs> uh, greetings everyone from Minnesota where it's going to be a hundred degrees today. Uh, and, uh, I, just a little bit about myself. I grew up on a farm in Burns Township uh, in Henry County. Um, I have more or less 100% Swedish ancestry. And uh, I, uh, grew, I grew up running around in Bishop Hill when my father pitched softball. Uh, Pete Anderson was his name. And we had roving gangs of kids who uh, ran around Bishop Hill exploring what we could find. So um, I started work, work doing research in, in Bishop Hill in 1972 uh, when I was, uh, uh, I just uh, finished junior year at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. And I was on an archeological dig. The first one we did was we dug up the privy at the hotel, Bjorkland Hotel followed by in 1973, digging for the footings for the hotel barn, and finally in 74 for the park fence. Uh, I also worked a lot with Edla Warner uh, on, uh, on the archives, ar arranging and sorting the archives, uh, and also on genealogical research. And all of this was before we had computers. So it was uh, a lot of work. And um, then uh, in 1979, my former late husband, Hiram Wilson and I spent uh, 14 months in Sweden studying the material cultural background of the Bishop Hill colony. And uh, 
I still have wonderful friends there in Helsingland primarily, but we traveled throughout the entire area of um, the Jansenist, uh, con the Jansenist uh, membership. And today, and I have a little uh, red peony here with me uh, to uh, commemorate Edla Warner, who in the picture is sitting uh, on top of the Bjorkland Hotel before it was, uh, before the tower was put on uh, or replaced. And uh, she and I would always take peonies to put on the graves of the colonists on Memorial Day. And the other picture is Ronald E. Nelson, who was uh, the prime mover of restoration in the Bishop Hill, in Bishop Hill. And I'm also, I've also got a little bag of rusks from, uh, if any of you remember Helen and I own Berg. They made the best rusks ever and uh, always were willing to share. Hard bread. Uh, it's a kind of, um, you, you make a, a special bread dough, you bake it, and then you cut it in slices and and drop and toast it in the oven. Skortbor, it's they are called in uh, Swedish. We'll call it uh... okay. So the material culture in the Bishop Hill colony restoration inventory for Bishop Hill historic site uh, was the name of the report, which runs over 550 pages. Um, we use the following sources, uh, Bishop Hill Colony records and inventories, uh, published period accounts, letters and visitor accounts, inventories done at the time of the colony solution, dissolution. And I sat and transcribed uh, and typed up on an old fashioned typewriter, uh, well, I think about 250 pages single spaced of colony inventories. Um, the Philip J. Stoneberg interviews with colonists that were done about 1900 and archival materials in the US and Sweden. Bishop Hill Colony artifacts and buildings, photographs, Olaf Kranz paintings and, and interviews with contemporary Bishop Hill residents. Uh, here is page one of the table of contents of the restoration inventory, which is uh, basically a narrative uh, of um, what our findings were and a comparison of the material culture of Sweden uh, in the areas the colonists came from and Bishop Hill. And then we have the appendices, which are all of the uh, transcribed documents uh, that uh, uh, included lots and lots of inventories and interviews and maps and all kinds of things. Uh, okay, so what did the colonists, what was their vision? They preached that Bishop, Bishop Hill was the city to which all people were to come and that it was the chosen city. And so they worked with the future in mind to build a strong and prosperous place. And I think this is, for me, the best statement of what they were up to that I have ever seen. It's from an interview in 1903 with a colony member. Okay, where were they from? Uh, these are the Swedish provinces. Most were from Helsingland. Uh, and the rest were from neighboring, uh, neighboring uh, uh, provinces. Yestrigland, the second largest contingent was from Upland. Uh, I don't know exactly how many were from Vestmanland. I, it's, and even from Herjedalen, which is way up uh, north, 
northwest of Helsingland and from Ångermanland. And then there were individuals from other provinces. And that was really an interesting thing because a lot of them brought different knowledge to the colony that could be used in the development. And so I am certain that the total emigration was at least 1,500 when you count all the deaths and one, uh, one ship that sank and so forth. I also want to point out that in, the, in Sweden, the area they came from was full of ironworks. Uh, and Sweden, uh, this was their main, the Sweden's main um, export was iron. And other than that, the that this country was on kind of the brink of industrialization, but, uh, and modernization, but not really uh, uh, started yet. The other photograph is, is how they made fuel for iron processing, which was burning of charcoal throughout this whole region. And as you probably know, charcoal burning, you have to take wood and it's a reduction process to make the charcoal. Um, this is a little hard to see, but it points out that virtually all of the uh, uh, um, uh, parishes where the Jansenists came from are on the main roads. Uh, up north is Hudiksvall, and then you go west and come down through uh, Helsingland and Upland, and those are exa that's exactly where the parishes were, which is not surprising since those were the main, uh, not only uh, that, those were the main roads that people traveled, but also the travel of information and the travel of new ideas. Uh, here are uh, some uh, estimates of the number of um, people from each of the parishes in, uh, in Helsingland. Um, and uh, when I was at Knox College, I did a, uh, a, uh, an honors thesis on kinship within parish groups. And there was, it was very tight uh, kinship among the Jansenists and especially siblings adult siblings and their their families and parents. Uh, I did a study of the immigrants from Sudarala Parish and 104 of 140, at least 104, were directly related to Jonas Olson and Olaf Olson. Okay, here's what's what they left. <laughs> uh, log structures uh, built, you know, Sweden had trees and water and iron and some other, uh, uh, and copper, and they had lots of rocks. And the main areas that were farmed are the river valleys. Um, so these are what some of these big farms look like. The one that's in the lower left is Eric Anders from Sudarala, which is on the World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage uh, Helsinga Gordar uh, sites. And it is also the home of one of the Jansenists who was Jonas Eriksson. No, yes, Jonas Eriksson, who was a trustee. Okay, let's see. All right, here we are in Bishop Hill in about 1846. And I must say, this is one of the, I think, Olaf Kron's best paintings. How the heck did he paint this, you know? Uh, from, because he wasn't there when it looked like this. And I'm convinced that he worked closely with Philip J. Stoneberg 
And uh, the people that Stoneberg interviewed um, uh, to be able to, um, to uh, build these buildings. And in the background, of course, you see the, the, build, the white uh, buildings are the ones that were basically log cabins with tent roofs. Uh, later, they did uh, 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 put oak shingles on the largest building, which was a uh, cross-shaped church and dwelling building, chapel and dwelling building. And there were, um, between the, the white buildings and what are called the dugouts, there were uh, eight on each side in that ravine. Uh, there were sod kitchens. They built it out of sod, which was basically the unbroken prairie. You took big chunks out of that and mm -hmm. made two, or actually three, 75 foot long uh, sod kitchens. Uh, here are a couple examples of the uh, Ayod Kula, which is basically a storage uh, uh, cellar, and a Bakstuga, which is uh, a place where someone who was without much in terms of means would live. Uh, and it's very similar actually to the to the ones in the picture from Bishop Hill. Uh, also, these men who burn charcoal out in the forests would live in these uh, type of dwellings. Oops. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is a drawing that's in the in the, or in the report uh, from uh, Lars Lindbeck, and he shows. Uh, where the dugouts were. And in all, there were actually a total of 28 dugouts. Uh, and I, I wanted to say that there's some interesting things about the dugouts. And that is that uh, they, the people who lived in these dugouts, they were sorted by parishes. So people who, uh, there, there, there was one. There were probably more than one for the bigger parishes, but uh, they, they not only lived together, but they ate together. <laughs> I'm looking at my notes here. Where's my? And uh, another thing that they did was they took. Um, you know, they they. The first group arrived in the uh, fall uh, of 1846, and they were without food or anything. And so they put, set about remaking their own clothes and selling items to people uh, in the, in the uh, uh, area in order to get money to buy food and some of the women had silk scarves that they had brought and they were also sold to people. Uh, okay. I see that there are two people in the waiting room. Now what? I went view. All right. Okay. And uh, here's another drawing by Lars Lindbeck, uh, which shows the complete layout they had uh, of the dugouts and the sod kitchens and uh, adobe houses that they were made out of raw brick. And the, some of these dugouts and raw brick houses were still being used at the time of the, the uh, dissolution. 
Some of the uh, dugouts were being used for uh, holding livestock, for example. And as you, uh, if you know about Bishop Hill history, they, the tent church and the other log buildings burned down. Uh, some old man, uh, the story is, was smoking and managed to set on fire some chaff from flax that burned down the buildings. Uh, all right, so 1847, lots of deaths. Uh, they had, uh, they suffered from uh, uh, malaria and dysentery and other diseases. And then uh, desertions, as an estimated 200 people went to, uh, went uh, to be Methodists uh, in uh, Vic near what is now Victoria, Illinois. Uh, there then came new arrivals and construction. They built a sawmill that was water powered, a grist mill that was water powered. They also bought, uh, they also built a windmill that was used to grind uh, flour. Uh, I don't know what, um, I don't know much at all about, about it, but uh, the idea was that when the uh, river uh, was at low ebb, they would grind using the, the uh, wind powered the, uh, mill. They also started the tannery and the brickyards and built three frame houses. Uh, the Red House, which has always been called the Eric Jansen House, at the Weaving Building and the Taylor and Shoemaker Shop, which were both north of where the church is in Bishop Hill now. And here we have some pictures. Uh, there were two log cabins at Red Oak, where uh, west of Bishop Hill, where there was this great forest of many types of trees. And um, the, there were two of these log cabins for people where people stayed. And there on the right is the frame house that uh, was the weaving building. And basically all three of the frame houses they built at this time were about the same as this one. And then finally, the, in the lower left, there's a grist, the grist mill, water-driven grist mill uh, from 1847. And I've always wondered, are there, are the, is that a Bishop Hill wagon in that picture? I don't know. <laughs> OK. And then the colony church was uh, built in 1848. Uh, it was the first use of burned bricks. And uh, a lot of the lumber, including the siding and so forth, was brought from Peru, Illinois, where uh, white pine was coming down from Michigan and Wisconsin uh, and available. That There's raw brick or adobe nogging, which is basically insulation. The pews are of walnut and maple and show great use of the lathe and the water mill. And uh, the dwelling room, there were dwelling rooms uh, on the, uh, the ground floor, which uh, were for uh, the single people. Uh, and on the first floor, there were 10 rooms for families. And some of them had several families in the same room. Uh, I don't know, I, I seem to remember that, the, that in the lower level uh, rooms there had been fireplaces, uh, but um, I don't know exactly what the situation was on the, on the first floor. Um, okay, now I just have a couple of, of examples of, of what might have been in their minds of what, what, what they wanted the place to look like. 
If you look in the upper left, that's the chapel at Voxnabrück. And you see that behind this, the front part of it is a gambrel uh, frame church. So it's not that they didn't know, you know, that kind of architecture. And also on these, uh, uh, in these ironworks, the, the chapels were simpler and uh, were built for the workers. And then we have the example of where the owner lived in the lower left. And uh, here's a church of a picture of painted by Olaf Kranz of Nora Parish Church. And it also has a gambrel roof. Okay, 1849, the steam mill. It was supposed to be a distillery and it had two boilers and it was coal fired. The colony had a coal mine of sorts uh, about uh, 10 miles southeast in Knox County, Knox County, Illinois, that was called the Coal Bank. Um, and uh, there was there were there was some sort of dwelling there. There were, were beds for two people. So if they stayed overnight, um, they could sleep there. But uh, they must have had to have a lot of uh, coal to uh, fuel this huge uh, steam mill. And a lot of what they did was uh, they milled for profit. In the beginning, they they would take the farmers from the area and from a wide area would bring their grain and the colony would take 20% of what they brought and after it was milled. But then they did that after a while they started to charge uh, money for uh, all of the all of the milling milling. There were also lots of machines in there, uh, including woodworking machines uh, and two giant boilers from Rock Island uh, and two pairs of grindstones. And, and so there's on the, in the lower area, uh, uh, there's a, uh, on the lower right is a water mill, which was used for woodworking and also a scutching mill which we will talk about, and a carding machine for uh, wool. And behind, to the left of that little mill is the white dye house, which, okay. All right, uh, I have a question uh, about Olaf Kranz's uh, painting. It's called Pile Driving and uh, it's always assumed they're building a bridge, but I think they were damming the river for mill ponds. The Stoneberg interviews uh, talk about this, and the colony actually had four dams along the Edgeworth River to create mill ponds. All right, uh, now we're coming to 1850, and Eric Jansen was shot, and uh, um, and killed. Uh, but here are two pages from his seven pages from the seven page inventory or a state uh, record uh, uh, when he died. And it includes all of the uh, movable property in the entire colony. Uh, I think it's just fascinating. Someone did this in English, um, but it gives lots of detail. And it's very interesting to read, to find out what he wore, one of which was a uh, the infamous black cloak that he was, and it was worth 20 bucks. Uh, and a dollar the, then is about uh, equivalent to $34 today. So that was a very expensive uh, garment.
All right, 1851 to 1854, we have the big brick or the Schuchs uh, which is uh, the kitchen building um, or the big building, store Bignian. Uh, this was quite the undertaking in the, uh, between 1849 and uh, uh, 1851, the uh, whole thing was built. There were um, uh, 72 rooms. And I, I think I figured out uh, that they were a little over 20 feet by 20 feet. Uh, in size for dwelling rooms. Um, and in the lower level, uh, there was the kitchen and the dining rooms. Uh, in the north end, they put in uh, fireplaces. And in the south end, which was a, the, uh, built later, they had stoves. And uh, when the uh, when the big brick burned in 1928, only 19 of the rooms were uh, occupied, uh, and it said that some of the people had had papered over the fireplaces. So. <laughs> and the other thing in the lower picture is to note outbuildings. One of the things we know uh, only a little about are all of the outbuildings, and I, you know, uh, okay, so they had to, they had to have privies, and they had to have wood to burn uh, in the uh, fireplaces or the or the uh, um, stoves, and uh, so there were many, many uh, of these outbuildings and lean-tos and what they called shanties all over the place in, in Bishop Hill. Okay, the other thing to note is that uh, Eric Johnson and when he remarried in 1850, they then moved to the Big Brick and he was, they lived on the top floor on the north end. So, uh, okay, and then there's the food processing complex of uh, uh, a smokehouse, an ice house, a slaughterhouse, barns, and a meat storage house for keeping the meat from spoiling. Uh, in addition, a bakery and brewery, uh, which was quite uh, close to the big brick because the, uh, the dining rooms uh, were in the big brick. Uh, then you'll see that the, uh, there was a dwelling house called the Southwest House. Uh, built in 1852, and that was uh, the section A in the floor plan. It was two stories and eight rooms, and then it was enlarged for the hotel. After the steeple building in Bishop Hill did not become a hotel, and then the second sections were uh, section B and C were built later. Um, so it eventually became the, uh, Bjork, what we know as the Bjorkland Hotel. 1853, Bishop Hill Colony Incorporated for the purposes of manufacturing, milling, mechanical businesses and merchandising. Um, so this is when uh, they started to really become um, uh, looking for uh, uh, being a business. They, they, they became a business essentially and uh, uh, a giant business. The 
carpentry and uh, paint building, painting building were, was built in 1832. A lot of carriages and wagons were made there. Uh, then we have two very fine Greek revival uh, buildings. Um, the Bishop Hill Colony store that was built by American Masons and the steeple building or Tonbignian, uh, which was first intended as a hotel and then a school if they became celibate, uh, which was not, which did not happen. And in the end, the rooms were used as school rooms and dwelling rooms. I believe the school rooms were on the first floor uh, on either side of the opening uh, with the pillars. And I love this picture because there's people all over the building. <laughs> uh, also, you know, the originally the, uh, the clock tower was two stories high uh, and the roof was flat. Um, okay, and there, uh, I did find one, one uh, uh, account of, uh, that said that a New England architect had been involved in the design of these two buildings, which I found very interesting, but found no more information about that. Uh, also in 1854, they uh, built a boarding house and, and hotel in Galva. Uh, uh, this was at the time that the railroad was being built in Galva and many Bishop Hill colonists were working in Galva. The colony owned 50 town lots in Galva. So they, they were also building houses and so forth. Um, and this was all part of the plan to, uh, the business plan, so to speak, uh, the Bishop Hill Colony store and warehouse, uh, was a huge undertaking, uh, for the colony to sell their merchandise. All right, we have here, uh, houses or buildings built in 1855. The Red Oak House, which was in modern times moved to Bishop Hill, uh, a new uh, place for people to stay at Red Oak. Uh, Krusbu uh, or Gooseberry Grove. We're gonna talk about where these are located in a bit. And the hospital building, Hrikusit. Um, the apartment building, the first one, with 15 rooms on three levels. And this, this and the steeple building were the first that were stuccoed, uh, which was an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. I think it was to make them look more like city buildings. They were, they were more uh, sophisticated. And then the dairy building, uh, Lade Gordon, which is uh, where the milkmaids uh, uh, stayed and where the, in, in proximity to the cows and milked the cows. Uh, okay, then 1856, the administration administrative building, which is the closest one in the upper uh, upper photograph with 15 dwelling rooms on three levels. And on both of the, the buildings, these two were L-shaped and uh, virtually uh, identical in plan. Uh, there were rooms down uh, sort of semi uh, subterranean <laughs> uh, in both of these buildings. And then the blacksmith shop was built in 1857. But one account I found when uh, Philip Stoneberg uh, interview said it was built uh, before the steeple building. And I'm, I'm very curious about this because if 
if this was built in 1957, where were the blacksmiths before uh, then? <laughs> uh, I don't have any information about that. Uh, then in the 1857 to 58 additions were made to the hotel, uh, an L-shaped addition, if, if, and uh, it was still uh, two stories. And then uh, uh, 1860 to 61, the colony school was built as a one-story building, some people wanted it to be two stories so that they would have uh, higher education. In the colony, uh, education was six, age six to age 14 and six months of the year. Um, so some people thought that it would be better for them to get more education. But uh, there was a lightning strike and they considered the people who were more conservative thought that was a sign. So they made it one story. And it also had the bell that was used in 1846. So <laughs> to call people uh, to meetings and to meals. Uh, here is the colony, the Bjorklund Hotel, named for Swan Bjorklund, uh, who received the hotel as his share in the colony dissolution. Uh, he had been, uh, he immigrated in 1852 and eventually became the uh, um, um, hotel uh, operator. Uh, and so there's a picture there of the Bishop Hill Civil War Company D. And this is interesting because it shows the privy in the barn of uh, which I worked on the archeology span of. And uh, Bjorklund added the third story and tower after 1861, but this company was mustered in 1862, and there were obviously three floors. So it must have happened fairly quickly. Um, I see somebody's in the waiting room again. Okay, whoops. Whoops. I'm trying to figure out how to admit somebody participants, waiting room. Uh, okay, I think it's okay. Anyway, uh, it's possible that he used materials that were left over because they had the materials to build a two-story school and they didn't build a two-story school, so. Um, influences. Was Bishop Hill meant to be a village, a parish, or a city? And so many of the colonists said that it was to be a city. So here are some of the uh, possible ways that they conceived that that city would appear. And then also there were the ironworks and the different uh, uh, places where there were lots of workers. Uh, and here, for example, in the lower right is a workers quarters in Yusne at the sawmill, uh, which bears some resemblance to the big brick. Am I still being Alan? heard? Carolyn, uh, yeah. you're, not, you're not sharing your PowerPoint anymore. We just oh no. How'd that happen? Here comes my help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, play. Play. 
Okay, is that better? No, nope, still see you. Oh. Yeah. Share screen. Okay. Yeah, the last slide we saw was the uh, Bjorkland Hotel. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. We're good. All right. Well, uh, let's see. I was saying that um, uh, these are. This is a picture of the town or city of Söderham at the time they left, and what is this the kind of place they were envisioning? And you see that the. The building, uh, which was the original courthouse in the in the lo lower picture, um, might have been in their minds, and then there were places uh, where workers, uh, like iron work, ironworks and sawmills, uh, where there were workers' quarters like this. Uh, this one was called Long Kadishation, and it uh, has some similarity to uh, uh, the uh, big brick. <laughs> All right, we're moving on to flax production. Uh, flax production was a very complicated matter. Uh, you had to pull it up by the roots and dry it and shock it and the seeds were removed and it was redded in running water and then dried and then broken with a club or a water dri driven mill. And then there was the scutching and the hackling. So it was really a lot of work and it was women's work. <laughs> so um, here is an example of a scutching mill in Helsingland and uh, the scutching mill interior, um, which is what they had in Bishop Hill. They had a scutching mill like this in Bishop Hill in their water driven mill, uh, which made the, the work of scutching much easier. Uh, so flax was first grown in 1847 and 1848 they had the flax mill. And then in 1850, a machine for thresh threshing flax seed, which was sold to farmers for livestock. And here are the woman, women from Forshaparge in Helsingland who were in charge. Uh, the family was called Stoneberg. The young man is Philip Stoneberg who did um, uh, so many of the interviews. And then the uh, woman to, uh, uh, the younger woman is his mother. And then the three older women are, uh, two sisters and a sister-in-law who ran the whole production of weaving, uh, we flax production and weaving. Uh, here we have uh, a Bishop Hill Colony spinning wheel compared to a Helsingland spinning wheel, virtually identical, except that in the colony they made them of hardwood. Uh, and it, 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 it really is a question in my mind. They must have had somebody who really know, knew how to make spinning wheels and looms and so forth. Because if you just tried to make one, it, you know, based on memory or, uh, or, you know, you couldn't do it, especially these complicated looms that they used. And then in the lower uh, right is a stone linen mangle, which is used to mangle the linen. You don't iron uh, uh, linen, you mangle it. <laughs> Here's this, this beautiful picture uh, of uh, uh, Christine Forsch, who is using a colony spinning wheel. She is spinning wool. Uh, and this is post-colony, uh, but I just think this is one of the best pictures ever. <laughs> um, okay, so we will 
Um, all right, so there was many, I mean, there's a lot of information here and uh, they, the types of linen that they uh, made. Uh, and this was, you know, for many years, the really the most uh, profitable business that they had. Uh, they also sold lots of rag carpet, uh, rag carpeting. So altogether, 130,309 yards were sold and 222,569 yards of carpeting. Um, they did have some walking wheels, the bigger wheels, and that was probably used for wool. All right, we're going to talk here about clothing. Uh, and these are some more of my favorite pictures. Uh, in, uh, night, in the early 1920s, Anna Söderblom and her husband, the Archbishop uh, Söderblom from Sweden visited Bishop Hill. Uh, actually, he had two cousins in Bishop Hill. One was Olaf Johnson, the other was Swan Swanson. And uh, she commented, that the older people in Bishop Hill looked just like, you know, they had come out of the uh, old time uh, peasant society in Bishop Hill because they were wearing uh, similar clothing. Um, in 1859, Jonas Olson's daughter, Karen, Karin, went to the Shakers and she learned dyeing and dressmaking. And in the colony, uh, the men got their clothes from the tailors. And for the most part, the women made their own clothes. Uh, so she made Sunday dresses uh, for women of gingham and calico, which was purchased uh, fabric. Here we have some more wonderful uh, pictures. Uh, I like the picture on of the woman. Uh, uh, I think that's Karen Danielson, probably uh, in the upper right, who is wearing a shawl wrapped around her shoulders, uh, which was uh, very common. Okay, so in the clothing distribution, here's what the men got, and here's what the women got. Uh, uh, there are, this is from the, uh, from the records. Um, so they were on the whole very well dressed and it was, uh, um, it was said though that the uh, colony leaders were even better dressed because they traveled around and uh, worked in the larger society. Uh, they would get uh, one set of clothes, uh, two sets of clothes a year, or the material to make uh, um, their own clothes. And they would also get, uh, men got shoes and boots. Uh, I think women only got shoes unless they were working in the barns, and then they got boots. Um, on the left is a, a colony. Uh, uh, shoemaker um, bench. And on the right is a picture from the, uh, um, uh, a picture of one of the dresses uh, designed and made by Karen Olson, uh, which is in the National Archives, this picture. Oh, and I just had to put this in because uh, Eric Olson in the letter that is in Lily Sederdahl's uh, new book gave advice to people back home telling them to, uh, if they can, uh, bring the warmest fur coat they can or one like people wore in Helsingland, a black uh, sheepskin coat and of course this is Nils Helboom wearing 
the coat <laughs> that they were talking about. All right, agriculture. Most of you I'm sure are familiar with all of these scenes that again were uh, based on uh, uh, information that was collected in 1896 uh, by Philip Stoneberg from original colonists. Uh, here are the colony land holdings in 18, uh, from 1846 to 1861. Uh, there, was there were always problems with titles and mortgages. <laughs> throughout the uh, colony. Uh, one, one of the things they did was, okay, they bought a piece of land and they put down the uh, deed for another piece of land as uh, you know security for that new piece of land. Uh, this happened uh, early on with LaGrange. They owned a farm in LaGrange. Uh, they went to Peoria to get iron, a thousand dollars worth. So they put down the deed for Lagrange for the farm, uh, and uh, when they went back to try to pay it off, the the uh, dealer they were dealing with said, uh, "Okay, somebody offered me ten thousand dollars for that land," and they didn't want to pay $10,000, so they lost that farm. And so it was uh, uh, well, it, many things were like that. They would buy lots of things with the goods and then sign a promissory note that they and that they would pay off the rest. But they never seemed to actually have much cash to pay. <laughs> pay things off. All right, so uh, the agricultural departments on the inventories are these uh, Southeast, Southwest, Home, North, Department of 45, which I don't know what that was, Red Oak and Galva Farms. Uh, the names of the outposts are here that were in the inventories. And here is a map that comes from uh, George Swank's book. Um, and uh, they it's really hard to figure out uh, uh, all of the names and the locations, but uh, whoops. And I know Brita, you've been working on this. Uh, but I think they had multiple names. I think they had, uh, they had names and they had nicknames and they had English names and Swedish names and uh, um, these were these were places where people went out and uh, and stayed while they were doing work. Uh, Red Oak was really important because that was where they cut lots of wood um, and. Uh, the cruise bowl was where they made butter and cheese and they made they had a, uh, a, a horse powered butter churn uh, and made lots of it and most of it for sale. Uh, okay, here we have some information about uh, um, what the uh, livestock who the livestock were. They had horse barn out that was 150 feet long with 200 horses. They had a cow barn, a cow barn that was 300 to 400 feet long. That's like, uh, you know, the size of the length of a football field. <laughs> so uh, they had gardens, they had an orchard with 500 fruit trees. Uh, Uh, this is a uh, from the uh, report, Land Under Cultivation in 1859, 
and all of the different uh, crops and how much acreage there was for each of the crops. Uh, these uh, tell you some of their farming equipment. They always had the latest and best and tried to purchase the, the, uh, the newest implements. They also made plows and cultivators and, or plows and harrows and such uh, for sale. 1851, cultivation of broom corn was six acres and they got $50 per ton. Uh, here you see how much they sold. Their brew making equipment came from the shakers and their largest sales were um, listed here. Uh, they made eight different sizes of brooms and they put, actually they put labels on the brooms uh, Bishop Colony labels on the brooms. Don't we wish we had some of those? <laughs> uh, the industry was located at the top of the hill at the east edge of Bishop Hill. And this was like a village in and of itself. And you can kind of look beyond the, the steeple building here to see uh, where it was located. Um, but the entire broom cord village and the crop uh, burned in 1861, which was not a good thing in 1861 when they had lots of other problems. <laughs> okay, now we're talking about food. And here's my compilation of the menu. <laughs> All that they, uh, that, uh, they may have had to eat. Um, in the uh, in the bakery and brewery building, the oven was in between the bakery and the brewery. Uh, they um, also had a really big iron uh, uh, grill, or I guess you'd call it a grill, to make pancakes. And they made uh, pancakes and they made both thick and thin, they said. Um, and uh, I think I won't, uh, I think I'll move on. They had lots of wild foods. They brewed small beer daily with wild hops and barley malt. 10 barrels per day were consumed. Uh, they had uh, garden produce, they had wild meat. Um, and different kinds of bread. Um, I should also say that they had wheat bread for special occasions, which was a real treat. Now the coffee, that's a story. They boiled it, they boiled the coffee with roasted cornbread, wheat, or hard bread. And it was, must have been more like uh, gruel, <laughs> served with milk and molasses. Uh, and I, I read an account where it said that the most uh, real coffee was 50% um, was in this concoction. Uh, also, I, there's a receipt uh, in the records for uh, the purchase of over 1,200 pounds of coffee. <laughs> and in 1859, the leadership proposed that they do away with coffee because it was a luxury and the, pro the, the members protested and said, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. So they got coffee uh, for breakfast and they got tea at supper time. Whoops. Um, now the fish, I never realized how much fish they ate, but they ate a lot of fish. They had fishing camps at both Rock Island and on the Illinois River. And barrels of salted fish were sent back. They had large quantities. One shipment came in at 59 barrels of, of uh, and they also purchased fish from Chicago. Uh, so um, they, 
I can, I, we can honestly say that their diet was very Swedish. They ate uh, both their clothing and their diet were actually uh, very Swedish in, in, in uh, character. They purchased condiments and spices and at Christmas they supposedly had lutefisk. The only thing I, I could think of was they made it uh, out of uh, a fish that they had purchased because it's... Uh, and they had 4th of July and harvest festivals with puddings, pies, and other delicacies, which of course continues still in Bishop Hill, uh, the puddings and, or the, uh, especially the pies. Uh, I, I read in also that in 1855, they invited the entire town of Altona to the uh, 4th of July festival. <laughs> uh, okay. Here we have uh, furniture and the main difference here between uh, uh, Sweden and the US is that they had hardwood. Um, and the styles of furniture that they made were the styles that were uh, uh, becoming popular in Sweden at the time they left. They weren't the old fashioned kinds of furniture that we think of as classic folk furniture in Sweden. Um, they made uh, uh, lots of tables, um, lots of cupboards. Uh, they were either made of hardwood or pine, which was painted uh, or grained. Um, the hotel chair is interesting because they, those, the, they're made of cherry, but they're a perfect example of a style that was very popular in Sweden at the time, an Ustravola chair. Um, uh, Boss, the Boston rockers the colony made, however, were very different from um, rocking chairs in Sweden. They really, uh, made them according to American style. Uh, here's a desk, wardrobe, and chest. The chest that's on, on the bottom is one that I have, which was purchased by my sister in Bishop Hill um, sometime in the 1990s, and she took about, I don't know how many layers of paint off of it. But it's very interesting because it's made of cherry, and uh, the boards are the full width of uh, 18 inches, and it's a perfectly symmetrical. It's, it's 36 inches wide, 18 inches tall, and then the ends are also 18 inches. Um, and uh, I like the picture of the top of it where it shows that they had put uh, some kind of uh, maybe uh, some kind of uh, oil or some kind of can of something on it. Um, uh, I don't have any pictures of the uh, drag singer, uh, pull out beds and the pull out sofas. So these are Swedish examples, but there were examples, of course, in Bishop Hill. And an interesting thing is that, um, you know, the Bible tables, and the uh, 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 the pullout furniture do not appear on the inventories because the inventories only cover uh, that they, they, they did not cover the dwelling rooms. They only cover the outposts. Um, so you don't see these pieces of furniture on the inventories which makes me think that they were in the dwelling houses or the dwelling rooms. Um, and certainly uh, there is evidence that every family had a Bible. And so the Bible tables, that makes sense that they, uh, that uh, they had that for their Bible. This is the only picture that might be 
taken in one of the dwelling rooms uh, uh, in Bishop Hill, probably not during com uh, the colony time, of course. Uh, these are some of the kinds of furniture that they had. The uh, uh, the kitchen Windsor, the, the black chairs that are so familiar. Um, the beds are interesting because they had the pull-up beds and then the rope beds and then some other kinds of beds are listed in the inventory, so which makes me think that there were many uh, less uh, prestigious types of beds <laughs> or less. Uh, and of course, the amount of furniture that's left in Bishop Hill is, is minuscule compared to how much furniture they must have had. So I think that a lot of the furniture was much, uh, I think that people kept the really nice furniture as heirlooms and that uh, a lot of the furniture was, um, more utilitarian, shall we say. There were cradles and there were chests and chests of drawers and cupboards and desks. And uh, one thing that they uh, uh, made were dry sinks, which is an American um, uh, type of furniture. And that in the big brick, before you went into the dining room, you washed up at uh, wash stands uh, in the hallway. So um, uh, whatever they produced, they sold. It was a, a barter economy. I was mentioning this, that they traveled all over the place from the very beginning. They sent out peddlers to sell the uh, uh, the textiles and the clothing. And uh, so a lot of people were not there uh, a lot of the time. They were out selling things or the colony also outsourced workers, uh, including women who worked in people's houses and uh, as, as maids. And it's just uh, kind of amazing uh, to think about how widespread uh, the, the whole colony was in terms of its uh, uh, business and its, uh, its engagement with the larger community. Uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, blacksmithing, the smiths, there were there were six forges and one for horseshoes. Uh, there was a machine for turning iron, many specialized tools. Um, and the carriage and wagon industry and the plow production was huge. <laughs> uh, one of the Stoneberg interviews with Olaf Fresnel, who worked in the carriage shop, said they made a hundred wagons in one year, which is just amazing. <laughs> and uh, they made all kinds of other stuff as well, hinges and foot scrapers and oven doors. Uh, and of course the church chandeliers. Um, and people came to Bishop Hill uh, to get their horses shoed and of course, to shop at the, at the store uh, and maybe even order things through the store so that it wasn't an isolated place. There were people coming and going. Uh, and uh, um, I, I love the fact that they had a rope maker. He was a sailor from Bohuslen. His name was John Bjork. And he, that, that they raised hemp so that he could make rope. Otherwise rope was very expensive. Um, and they probably sold it to 
uh, like everything else. <laughs> uh, the tannery was run by a tanner from Dalana who had been trained in Falun. Uh, they made all this kinds of all these kinds of, of leather sheepskins and saddle leather and calf skins and horse hides and harness leather. Um, they bought hides and skins from outsiders. And Schilstrom uh, reported uh, in an interview that he had produced 3,000 hides in 5,000 skins uh, during the colony time. They had shoemakers and a tinsmith, which we don't know much about, a silver and goldsmith. That this was Eric Troil, who was from uh, Alfta Parish originally, uh, and he in the colony, when people got married, they got a they made gold. He made gold wedding rings out of gold coins, and he made silver christening spoons out of silver coins. There was the brickyard, which produced 5 million bricks. Um, and the Fisher Hill Colony population is rather difficult. <laughs> Although they kept a lot of records, they don't seem to have survived uh, unless I haven't found them. Uh, but uh, in 1850, the population on the US census was 415. And I think that must be before um, more people arrived in 1850. And in 1855, in a letter, uh, Lars Ersham from Nora sent home a letter that said there were about 800 inhabitants. If so, that was the height of the population. But in 1856, the colony records say there were 697. 1858, 655. Uh, and the total number of dwelling rooms in the colony was 150, counting the uh, the big brick and the two apartment buildings and the steeple building and wherever else people uh, were living, the church, which, uh... all right, my conclusion is how the heck did they do this? This was such an enterprise. Um, and uh, let's see here. There were a couple of interesting quotes from the letter of Eric Olson, the father of Olaf Kranz, written in 1851. And he said, No one is forced to work, one does only what one is able to do. And he said, We trade anything people want. The Americans come in droves to see how we have it. And it surprises them that we can live together like this. And he said after he, that he was writing this letter in 1851 after Eric Jansen was killed. And he said, you might doubt that Jansen's teaching will continue, but I can assure you that it does. And to an ever increasing degree, because now we have four men who have been selected to preach and take care of the duty and seven to take care uh, of the duties uh, of business. Uh, let's see. Oh, there are seven men who are in charge of what is earthly, he said. So this is the thing about Bishop Hill, you know, what... It was extremely advantageous for the people to live there who could specialize in what they wanted to do. And they could, they could work in, in, uh, with others on a daily basis. If you were a farmer and you always had to work by yourself 
or with your family, but they, these were large teams of people uh, who cooperated. And uh, also there was um, security because if you got sick, you could recover. You didn't have to go out and milk the cows or uh, whatever. And uh, also um, one thing that's very interesting is that women who had small children up to the age of six, they didn't have to work. They, uh, and their meals were brought to them to their dwelling uh, room uh, for both themselves and the, ch for themselves and for the, the children. So um, if one had, if one had a family of multiple children, uh, then it was a full-time job for the mom to take care of those kids. So there were many, many advantages to this way of life. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, Todd, are you there? Yeah, there's a question from uh, Mary er Erickson. Uh, she wants you to okay. talk more about the dissolution of the county. Uh, did the uh, teamwork, the communal work you were referring to, just stop all at once, or did it continue over time? Well, it's very interesting because there were two parties uh, at the time of the dissolution. And initially in 1860, one of the parties, which was called uh, the Bishop Hill Colony Party or the Olson Party, following Jonas Olson, uh, which consisted of two thirds of the membership, they had initially thought that the, the, the property would be divided up and everybody knew what they would own, but that they would continue to work it together. But then <laughs> they found out how, many, how deep in debt the colony was, was and uh, uh, it, it didn't, uh, it didn't work for them to continue to do that. And it was a long process from uh, 1861 to about 1866 or 68, because they had divided up the property, but they, ke the, they kept coming back to collect money to pay off the debts. And so, uh, most people, what they got kept shrinking and shrinking because uh, uh, they, um, the debts were horrendous, basically. And then there was a trial uh, and that lasted quite a while. And so uh, I hope that answers your question. I, hello? And then uh, we have a question is, has your 500 page report been published and how can you get a copy? This <laughs> good question. <laughs> well, that's a good question for Todd. How, how can we make this more available? And I do, uh, I do have a scan of it. So it would be possible, for example, to make it available on the Heritage uh, website. Um, if we can figure out how to do that, Todd. <laughs> uh, well, um, I was told Wefford, that your copy is state property. I mean, I, we got a copy of it in our archives, but we got it from the state. So that would be would something have we have to, you know, probably have to, you probably can get a copy if you contact the Bishop Hill State Historic Site. But uh, it's, yeah. you know, I was told it was, you know, state property. So state permission. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's, um, I don't know if as an author, if I have any rights or not, so. <laughs> uh, and then another question is, it, is the Methodist church here in town any way derived from the colony? Uh, yes. Quite a few of the members uh, of the colony founded that church. And uh, um, 
it's not something I know a lot about, but I know, uh, 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 for example, Anders Berglund, who was a very prominent preacher, was part of the founding of the Methodist Church, and several other people who were, you know, uh, pretty prominent in the colony uh, founded that church. Um, there was at one time a mission church in Bishop Hill, I understand, and then there were the Seventh Adventists, <laughs> who uh, are not the Seventh Advent, Second Adventists, who uh, were also in Bishop Hill. Are there any other questions? If so, you know, type them on chat or unmute your microphones and speak up. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, just want to remind people that our next program will be in person about Bishop Hill Colony. We'll be in person June 19th at the Dairy Building at 2 p.m. with uh, Louise Saradell talking about women of the material culture. I know we have some people from Sweden watching today. I know you guys can't make it from other people from other parts of the state, but uh, all our Bishop Hill County programs will be taped, including Lily's on June 19th, and we'll eventually work our way onto the uh, Bishop Hill Heritage Association's YouTube channel. Uh, also, uh, Lily's book about, new book about Bishop Hill, Bishop Over Frame, is coming out this month, uh, published by the Heritage. And we're also publishing a second book that should come out later out this summer, early fall. As some of you know, you, you have Eric Jansen made the hymnals and you had, you know, had the words, but we never had the music. We found the music. <laughs> and we're combining with the words so we can actually sing the songs the way they were sung by the colonists back in the 1850s. Once we get the, this is being done by a retired professor from Augustine, Alan Swanson. So that'll be a second book, a new book that we'll be publishing later on this year. Once yeah, I, I do know work. that uh, uh, when uh, Swan Bjorklund came to the colony in 1852, they then got, he was an organist and they got an organ and they had a choir. So uh, the choir sang during the services. My hope is once we get the book done, I can find a chorus and have them learn some of the songs and arrange a concert in the church. That's one of my yes. dream projects. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but uh, does anyone have any other questions or anything? Uh, this is Mary Erickson again. Mm -hmm. um, do you, is there a way to know for sure what, I, I, well, I grew up on a farm uh, west of Bishopville and I looked at your map there and, on, yeah. and it was on the border between Weller and Clover Township, the farm. The farm. And is there any way to absolutely, you know, trace that um, that uh, location? Yes, you would have to go to the courthouse in Cambridge, or ah. and you would have to look at the history of the deeds of that land. I remember it, it, I saw an abstract once and it was uh, given to a, a soldier in the, yeah. um, yeah. was it a Revolutionary War? Uh, uh, no, it was and the, then, the War of 1812. War uh, of 1812, okay, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. All right. And one more question. <laughs> um, when, when I used to drive, when my folks used to drive back from church, um, we used to, there used to be an unpaved road that was, you, you could drive west through the Red Oak Forest. Um, yeah. Is that, is that still there? Uh, anybody know? <laughs> it's a lot smaller now. <laughs> is, do you know if it's drivable? Oh. Well, I'll have to go investigate. Yeah, I'll you have to go investigate. I haven't been out there okay. for a while. <laughs> I well, just have private to property see. now. <laughs> oh, like the uh, memorial for the uh, that one village west of town where most of the people died. That's on private property back in the grove. You can't really get to it. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Brita. You're on mute. Yeah, you're muted. Unmute yourself. How confusing. 
There you go. I just want to say that this is a fabulous piece of work that you've done. I just can't imagine how much painstaking not only while you were in Sweden, but later in Bishop Hill and, and processing all this and transcribing. This is such a gift to all of us who are interested in Bishop Hill. And I just, I don't know what it would take to lobby the state of Illinois to free up that manuscript for publication. I mean, ideally they would publish it, but if they're not going to, and the heritage would do that, then I, I just think this really needs to be made available widely. I mean, I have I have my own mimeographed copy of this and I use it all the time, but really it, it needs to be available to the public. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I, I hope that we can, we can do that. It's uh, <laughs> because it was so much work, but it was also so much fun that uh, I would like to share it more widely. And, you know, the Bishop of Colony history is like this gigantic uh, jigsaw puzzle and all these little pieces you have to put together to really get the complete picture. <laughs> the more people we have working on it, the better. <laughs> And I just have, after working on this for several weeks now, I got so much stuff in my head. It's just like, oh, uh, if only, you know, um, if only it was all out there. Are there any, uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a question. <laughs> Pardon me. This is Courtney, Carolyn. Um, Courtney Stone okay. and I. I Hi, so it's, it's been for me about 25 years in the making to even hear your voice. I used to read your dissertation while I was in the Colony Hotel in undergraduate school working in the summer. So this is really cool. Uh, hey, Courtney, if you can speak up just a little bit or turn up your volume, it'd be great. Kind of hard to hear right now. Okay, is this better? Yep, not a little. <laughs> Uh, I have a question. I live in the in the red house, Eric Jansen's house, and yeah. not a lot of not a lot of information or history really um, that I received, even through talking to some of the folks that I did in the '80s and the early '90s. Um, I do have a a hand sketch layout that, I, that someone made um, that I got from the state archives. But what do you know about that original homestead? and the subsequent additions made in particular by the archivists? I honestly don't know about the subsequent editions. Uh, um, I do know it was a very basic, uh, um, a very basic frame house. And there was a lean-to that was originally used for visitors. And uh, it was sort of the beginning of the hotel uh, business <laughs> in Bishop Hill. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know a whole lot. Uh, an interesting thing occurs to me though, is that I ran across one source that talked about the fact that the colony um, said, the colony leaders said that relatives who came to visit people in Bishop Hill had to stay at the hotel, which I thought was really interesting because these must have been people who had left the colony, who came back and uh, had to stay at the hotel. <laughs> but uh, as far as the Red House, I don't know. I have a, I know there is a sketch that uh, shows the rooms and who lived in the rooms originally, but I will see if I can find it. I know uh, uh, I can get in touch with you. <laughs> Thank you, that'd be great. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I did, how do I get ready? You can speak up just a little bit, please. Okay, all right, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, this is Karen, your cousin. 
Um, Hi, Karen. <laughs> I was I was wondering if uh, these photographs, for example, the one of the boarding house in Galva is copyrighted or is this a, a photograph that I could use for a different purpose? Uh, well, I stole it out of a book, so <laughs> uh, I don't know where the original <laughs> is. Um. Uh, I don't know where the original photograph is. Maybe Todd does, but um, uh, well, I doubt if it's copy of it in the Wiley House in Galva. Yeah. Is, is it possible for me to put it in another publication? Uh, I don't see why not. We'll have to talk about that. The the one that I this is not the greatest photograph of it that I uh, that I showed, but uh, uh, one of the interesting things was that after the colony, uh, Eric uh, Jensen's wife uh, was there for uh, running the place for quite a while. So, <laughs> um, does does it still exist in Galva or has it been torn yes. down? It still exists. I believe it's still there. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Wow. Is the Wiley House, do anybody know if it's open in Galva? Uh, I do believe they have a website where you can get in touch with them and you can okay. call and leave a message, I think. Thank you. Yeah, they're not open to the public yet. They're hoping to later on this summer. <laughs> I'm planning to drive from Arizona to, El to uh, Bishop Hill, so I... I want to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Well, yes, I'm. I'm been raising my little hand here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, oh, Carol. We're, we're going to see you on video. <laughs> yeah, My, your friend. Uh, so nice and, to see you. It is. I was curious about this uh, cruise pool. I mean, yeah. the, the the concept of fair Buddha. I had no idea that there were fair Buddha in Bishop Hill, but but in Sweden, those uh, locations are common for a whole community, and it's located, you know, miles up in the woods. And here, it was quite close. So I was wondering, were yeah. they actually using this as a fair Buddha, or did they just have it for dairy? Uh, well, uh, it. I guess in the strictly Swedish sense, it wasn't a febu, but no. it was. Um, but it was. Uh, they took most of the cows out there in the summertime, okay. and produced cheese and butter yeah. and uh, uh, dairy products uh, on a big scale. But uh, it's basically the same function, actually. Yeah. Only only so much closer because the grazing was. The free grazing was kind of a uh, the core of it. And it was built uh, where they had wonderful pastures. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I saw on the map there was also a Norbu. Was it also a fair board? Uh, no, not that no. I know of. No, there were some other places where they uh, produced uh, cheese and uh, other dairy products, but in this was kind of the central one, although it, it wasn't built until 1855. So um, uh, what they did before that, I'm not sure. No. OK, thank you. And thank you thank so you much. You. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyone else raising their hand or have a question? Just speak up. After I unmute your microphone, of course. I'm not seeing anything in the chat room or on the video screens. Okay, and I have my email here if anybody uh, on the last page, so. Oh, right there. Yay. So we want to take a minute to copy it down if you think of some questions later on, you can email Dr. Anderson, of course. And uh, while you're doing that, I just want to take the time to thanks uh, Karen. Carolyn, for doing this today, taking time out of her day. And it was a wonderful 
experience revisiting all of this. Uh, uh, I should speak about Maria's mother who uh, taught me to make sausage and tunbrud and uh, many other uh, Swedish foods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. And her wonderful father who was so engaged with the research about Bishop Hill. Yeah, or, or, or her husband, maybe you think about. <laughs> yeah, you have so forward. Yes, I, I always regret I didn't come with Ture to, to Bishop Hill at the anniversary. And it's, it's so oh. sad I didn't, I couldn't make it, but I'm still planning to go there sometime before I die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do encourage people to come to Bishop Hill if you can. It is the 175th anniversary this year. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you one and all for, uh, for coming and joining our Zoom presentation today. Uh, Dr. Anderson, thank we greatly appreciate you doing this today. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, so thank you all so thank much. You. And again, our next presentation on Bishop Hill Connolly history is June 19th with Lily Saradell's program about women of the Bishop Hill Colony. And again, uh, that'll be in person, but we will tape it and put it on our Bishop Hill Heritage Association YouTube channel, just like we're gonna do with this presentation. So thank you one all. Uh, goodbye everyone and have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you everybody. Thank you, bye bye. Todd, do I have to shut it down? Yes, it just it just end the meeting. You'll be fine. Everyone else will be ending here. Uh, okay. Just yep. There you go. Just push leave at the bottom. Oh, end. Okay. Yep. And thank you so much.